Hey, welcome back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know you'd rather be at home getting fed by your parents, skiing on ski slopes. Uh, we did put skis on the van, you'll notice. So there's a snowboard on there somewhere for some of you who snowboard. Um, the rest of us who ski, we, we get the skis. Well, I want to start the semester off with a little competition. Now, one thing I noticed about Gordon students is you guys carry around with you water bottles a lot that are really nasty. Like, like some of the, the nastiest water bottles I've ever seen. I, you, you sit them on my desk and I look at them when you're talking to me, I'm like, whoa, that, is, that thing stinks. It's bad. Uh, diseases, germs, sickness, all sorts of things. So I want to have a little competition to see who has the nastiest, most well-loved water bottle in this chapel right now. And the winner of that contest gets a brand new water bottle filled with winter green. It's not winter. It's actually winto green lifesavers. Uh, the real deal. So bring them up here. Anyone brave enough to come up here with your nasty water bottles and stand up on stage? Come on. Oh, look, we got, we got a taker. Come on. Anyone else? Yes, Jaren. Wait, wait. There's, there's like a Levita. There's a Levita vibe going on here. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Thank you for your, your bravest. Come on up here. All right. Uh, just three. That's it. Okay. So that's, a, that's actually pretty gross, Maddie. It's, it's not too. All right. So what do, you, what do you guys think? By applause. This one, lots of stickers. I'm not going to take this from her. She gets to keep this. Don't worry. All right, that one, no one even noticed that you had. This one says non-recyclable weight. You stole that from a trash can. Wow. That's all good. It's all good. No, it's good. It's good. And that, there's like, there's some scum like growing underneath there. You guys all have some pretty, your, yours is broken. Okay, what do we think? Wait, wait, give me some applause. Tell, over here, over here. Okay, all right, let's try. You're getting a lot. And over here. Congratulations, you have a new water bottle. Thank you all. Okay, so don't worry. All of you who are the first losers, um, you get stickers on the way out. So they're going to be in baskets here and in baskets out there, and you can, you can make your water bottle look prettier with the Adventure Continues Proverbs sticker. So um, thank you guys for uh, humoring me in that. Well, we are going to adventure through the book of Proverbs this semester, and I hope that uh, you'll notice the van is going uphill in the snow. Um, hopefully our lives won't be that difficult, but I think life feels like that sometimes. And I really do believe that God has a lot of wisdom to share with us, to offer us through his whole word. But the book of Proverbs is like the concentrated multivitamin form of wisdom that we need to take on a regular basis. So we'll just jump right into this. You know, thousands of years ago, there was a young man who was about your age, and he was put into a position of incredible authority. Uh, in fact, he was put into the position of being the king of an entire nation. And not just any nation, but God's chosen nation, the nation of Israel. And you know this man's name was Solomon, right? Solomon, as a young adult, was put into this position to be a king. And he begins his rule, his reign, by going to a town called Gibeon. And what he did in Gibeon probably wouldn't be our first reaction of what to do when you're just made king, but I love that he did this. He went and he made 1,000, Solomon didn't do anything small, 1,000 burnt offerings to the Lord at the altar at Gibeon as a way to say, this is all about you, God. I, I respect you. I revere you. It is all about you. And, and after he gave these burnt offerings, he went to bed, and I'm sure he was feeling pretty good about himself. He was sleeping soundly, and he had a dream. This stuff really happened. This is so cool. And in that dream, God came to him and said, Solomon, ask me for whatever you want. 
and I will give it to you. Are you kidding me? God just gave Solomon the credit card. Anything you want, and I will give it to you. What would you ask for? Maybe the winning numbers to a certain $1.5 billion Powerball? I guess you could just ask for the $1.5 billion, but it'd be more fun to get it by you know, winning the numbers. Would you ask for, I haven't really thought about this, but just off the top of my head, like a Ford F-350 Super Duty truck with a 6.4 liter diesel motor in it? I, I don't know. Would you ask for something like that? It's a Power Stroke diesel? A trip to Hawaii? Yeah, maybe. That wouldn't be bad. My wife is like home going, woohoo, yes! A new water bottle? What would you ask for? You know, Solomon could have asked for anything. And we all know, maybe we don't all know, but what Solomon asked for was wisdom. Of all the things in the world that he could have had, he said, Lord, I want wisdom. I want the ability to rule and reign these people with justice, with rightness, wisely. I want wisdom. Can you imagine how proud God was of Solomon at that moment? Solomon, you've asked for, you could have asked for anything, but you asked for wisdom. You asked for a wise and discerning heart so that you could rule my people well. I am so pleased with you. Of course, you'll get that and even more. Wisdom is the ability to handle every area of life with skill. And let me tell you, we need that. We desperately need that. What would you have asked for? And, and I want to give you a little, you know, heads up here that the reality is we make a lot of decisions every day. In fact, some people say that we make up to 35,000 decisions every day. And I think that as we make those decisions, some of them are seamless. We don't even think we're making them, but we're making them. Some are much more intentional, but we make a lot of decisions. And wisdom is that ability to make a wise decision to handle life skillfully. And it will take us a long way to glorify God. Some of these decisions that we make aren't all that important. When we wake up in the morning, is it, is it like Apple Jacks or Cap'n Crunch? You know, you think about the, the, the feel in your mouth of Cap'n Crunch, and you're like, I'm going with the Apple Jacks. That you know, stuff rips it up. You think, am I going to have like four cups of coffee or six cups of coffee to start the day? I mean, what kind of decision is that? It's easy. Skinny jeans or sweatpants, you know, not too hard, right? Someone told me, they said, I, I, there's rumor out there, Tom, that you're wearing skinny jeans. I was like, whoa, cool. <laughs> Had no idea. Some of our decisions are really important, and they have a clear, morally right answer. Do I cheat on my test? No. Do I lie to my parents? No. Do I break the speed limit in my car? No. <laughs> I heard a yes, come on. <laughs> Do I tell the IRS about all my cash sales, even if I make the most amazing roast beef sandwich on the North Shore of Boston? Yes, you do tell the IRS. My heart was broken. When there is a clear, morally right answer, it's not that we don't know the right thing to do. It's just really hard to do the right thing sometimes, huh? That's not the kind of decision that is really hard to decide what to do. It's hard to actually do the right thing. And then there's another type of decision that we face, and this is the type of decision that really gets us. Because in this type of decision, there really is no clear morally right or wrong answer. And this is the type of decision that actually changes the trajectory of our lives. Where should I go to college? Should I go to college? What should I study when I'm in college? In fact, while I was writing this sermon, one student stopped by my office and another one called me and said, I need you to pray for me. I have no idea. I'm supposed to declare my major. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I said, oh, wow, cool. We're, I'm just talking about this right now. Those are the types of decisions that are difficult because there's no clear thou shall or thou shalt not that's right there in front of us. But these decisions change the trajectory of our, of our lives. Who should I date? Who should I marry? 
Where should I work when I graduate from college? These are the decisions that weigh heavy on us. And for these decisions, when God says, ask for anything you want, I I promise you, you're going to want to ask for wisdom. For wisdom. We need God's wisdom because these types of decisions are terrifying. But God wants us to flourish. He wants us to thrive. And in order to do that, we need to have God's wisdom. And once again, God's wisdom is the ability to live life with skill. Wisdom. The ability to live all of our lives with skill. You know, we can have lots of knowledge. We can know a lot about God's word, about Father God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ. We can have lots of facts in our minds. But that does not give us the the, the tools, the equipment to actually make the right decisions. I don't know if you guys remember this, but last summer there was a scandal that broke and a a computer hacker broke into the Ashley Madison website database. And Ashley Madison is a horrible website that allows people to commit adultery on their spouse without being found out, right? Great moral purpose there. And the hacker, God bless this hacker, he stole all the names of the people who signed up for this website, and he said, shut down your site, or I'm going to release these names out into the public. Ashley Madison called his bluff, said, I'm not, we're not shutting down. And he released the names. And here's the sad part. This is where I'm trying to say that we can know a lot about God, we can know a lot about God's word, but making the wise choice is not always easy to do. August 30th, 2015, the Sunday morning that those names were released, 400 pastors in North America resigned from their positions because their name were on that list. They may have known a lot about God, but they certainly did not make a wise choice in what they were doing. We need God's wisdom. And the book of Proverbs coaches us throughout the long and difficult journey of life. We need God's wisdom. The word wisdom actually is the same word used in Exodus 35 when it talks about the skilled craftsmen that come together and know exactly what they're doing to work on each intricate part of the tabernacle. We need that skill. We need God's wisdom. And that's why I get excited about jumping into the book of Proverbs. And in fact, we're not going to get to cover the entire book here in chapel, but we will have some cool opportunities as a community in March. How many days are in March? 31. How many chapters are in the book of Proverbs? 31. So ESPN has the 30 for 30. Gordon College has 31 for 31. (laughs) We, we're going to challenge each other to go through the entire book of Proverbs through the month of March. 31 chapters, 31 days. I want you to post on, on social media, on other places, what God is teaching you. Talk about it in your your conversations you're having in the dining hall. Talk about it in your dorms. Talk about it with your family, your friends. Let God teach you his wisdom as we dive into the book of Proverbs. Well, let's do that right now. Let's get into Proverbs chapter 1. Start at the very beginning. It's a good place to start. I know it's a Sound of Music reference. I, had to, I have to watch that every Christmas because I have three girls, and I, I do. I get, like, it's actually a pretty good movie. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 1, right in the middle of your Bible. Go past Psalms, first book you see, that's Proverbs. Let's open up to Proverbs chapter 1. We're going to read 1 to 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction For understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and understanding. Wow. You talk about an entrance to a book. Look at what Proverbs has to offer us. Look at this. So when we look at a book of scripture, remember we talk about this, we want to know who wrote it, who was it written to, and why did they write it? So we're going to jump into those questions. Who wrote it? 
Who was it written to and why did they write it? It's a good way to start any study of any book. Those three questions guide you on your way. So first of all, who wrote it? We know it was Solomon. Now, other people threw some stuff in there as well. Solomon is the primary writer of this book. And that's important for us because of, in the scripture, it says there's only one person whose wisdom sort of surpasses Solomon. Who's that? Sunday school answer. Give it to me. Jesus. That's right. Uh, Jesus is the only person whose wisdom exceeds that of Solomon. And, and that's a pretty cool thing. You're learning from, from the wisest man ever to live other than Jesus. Right there. So it, to give you an example, this would be like learning how to throw the football from Tom Brady, right? Oh, you got like, come on. All right. Who would you say? <laughs> Sarah, I know, has an answer to that. It would be like uh, learning how to play jazz piano from Bill Mooney McCoy. Yeah? I mean, this is like you're learning from the best of the best. How to win basketball games by Todd Murphy. 100 wins over here, right? Yeah. Coach Murphy. Yes, you can clap for that. So Solomon is giving us his wisdom. He's saying, I've got it for you. Here you go. Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Well, we know God wrote it, but he wrote it through Solomon. Others compiled some things in there. This is like the wise of the wise, Solomon. Love it. Solomon wrote it. Who was the book of Proverbs written to? Okay, well, this is pretty cool because it says it right here. It was written for giving prudence or shrewdness. The word prudence is a little bit strange. We talk about like prude. It's actually shrewd. Give shrewdness, wisdom to those who are simple, those just starting out, knowledge and discretion to the young. So yes, a lot of us here are young. This book is for you. But then for those of us up here that are a little older, uh, this book is also for us. So Bill, we're good. Don't worry. This book is for us too. It's for some old people too. It says it's for, for those who are, are also a little farther along and have a little more experience and you can get a grasp on things too. So in other words, this book of Proverbs is for anyone who is wise enough to listen and learn. It's for young, it's for old, it's for all of us. So that's a pretty cool thing right there. Proverbs was written by Solomon for anyone who is wise enough to listen. Now, why was the book of Proverbs written? And wow, verses 2 to 6, if you look at those verses, there are actually... Five purpose statements in there. You, you don't get, look at, and you know them by the, the word for. F-O-R, right there. Not the number, but the letter for. For gaining wisdom and instruction. For understanding words of insight. For receiving instruction in shrewd or prudent behavior. For doing what is right and just and fair. Anyone want to do what is right and just and fair? Yes, please, everyone raise your hand. This is justice in scripture. The foundation of it is wisdom from God what is right and just and fair, forgiving prudence, shrewdness to those who are simple, just starting out in life, knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance for understanding Proverbs, parables, and sayings and riddles of the wise. Just about every area you've got, practical, intellectual, moral, it digs deep down into the mysteries of life. The book of Proverbs has a lot to offer. One of the things I love about Proverbs is just how practical it is. This is not a pie-in-the-sky, faraway book that we're like, oh, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, it's just talking about all these abstract things. I mean, this doesn't get any more practical than this for Gordon College. Listen to this, Proverbs 15, 14. If anyone loudly blesses a neighbor, a roommate, a sweetmate, a hallmate early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. Don't go around loudly blessing people in the morning, folks. <laughs> Especially at Gordon College. No one sleeps here until the morning. <laughs> so it covers the marketplace, the business world, family relationships, friendships, marriage, sex. It talks about sex in here. Uh, and everyone's like, well, okay, great. <laughs> The whole world's talking about sex. What's the big deal? Okay. Well, this is what God has to say about it, and that is a big deal, and we're going to jump into that. Time management, study habits, productivity or lack of productivity. There's the great proverb that talks about a person who's so lazy, they can't even lift their hand up from the bowl to put food in there. Have you ever felt like that? I, 
Like I, 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 want, I want the Fruit Loops, I just cannot get them in my mouth. <laughs> Proverbs is all about ability to handle life with skill. Some of you are thinking in your head right now, I'm going to invent an automatic spoon. That's what I need, just an automatic spoon. You know, there's something different about Proverbs, though, because you could go to Amazon and you can type in how to handle life with skill, and I promise you thousands and thousands and thousands of hits will come up. Book after book after book after book will talk about how to handle life with skill. It's everywhere. That is the hot topic because we want to know how to handle life with skill. But there's something that separates Proverbs apart from all those other books, and it's found in verse 7 of chapter 1. That is the primary verse. If you had to put the whole book of Proverbs in one pregnant sentence, that's the one right there. The entire book is there. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But look at the contrast. But a fool is someone who despises wisdom and understanding. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and when we talk about fear of the Lord, we're not talking about like, oh my, look at, you know, like I have a fear of clowns, right? And, and are you not afraid of clowns? Seriously, some of you out there are smart and you're afraid of clowns. <laughs> Creepiest things ever, ever. And uh, so that's not like the type of fear we're talking about here. The type of fear we're talking about is a reverence and an awe, a respect. On Sunday after church, we were driving home from from our worship gathering, and we, we decided to drive by Bass Rocks in Gloucester and, and drive by the ocean, and a storm had churned up the Atlantic Ocean, and the waves were coming in with such force, and they were just slamming against the rocks and shooting up in the air, and my wife and I were talking about this sermon and about Proverbs and fear of the Lord, and she said, that's the type of fear that Proverbs 1-7 is talking about. You would not go out there and swim in that right now. There's an awe and a respect and a reverence for the ocean that you feel at this moment in your life that you are not going to go dive into those waves. That's what fear of the Lord is. Fear of the Lord is that, that admission to God that, yes, you are God and, and I am not. Is that hard to say for you? Say it with me. I, I, there is a God and it's not me. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, we need to remind ourselves of that every day, that fear of the Lord says there is a God and it's not me and, and I need to surrender, submit, bow down before, acknowledge that God knows best and that I don't and that is really hard to do. In fact, the words like discipline and guidance are not easy to swallow for us at times. But I promise you, that as we begin this journey, we're starting at a trailhead marked fear of the Lord. And before us is a path. And that path is the path we're called to walk in reverent awe and fear of the Lord. And it starts with fear of the Lord. And every time we put our foot down on that path, we are still stepping on the fear of the Lord. That we begin our journey of wisdom and, and skill and life, living life for God's honor and glory with fear of the Lord, and we continue to sustain it through fear of the Lord. I was trying to think of a real practical way to make this come to life, and the only thing I can say is that as I've been wrestling through the book of Proverbs for the past few months, I've started asking myself a question before I do anything, before I click on a link, before I say a word before I dial my phone, before I meet with someone, before I, I take a step, before I, you get the picture. I ask myself the question, is this the wise thing to do? And by wise, I mean, does this begin with fear of the Lord? Does this begin with an awe and a reverence and a respect for God's glory and renown? Does this honor God? And I don't think it gets more practical than that. And I'd like to challenge us this, this semester as we dig into the book of Proverbs to begin to ask that question before we do anything, before we, we speak a word, before we begin a relationship, before we utter anything 
to our friends, our family, our professors. Is this the wise thing to do? And wisdom begins with fear of the Lord. And wisdom is the ability to live life with skill. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm going to invite the band back up here. We're going to have one final song this morning, and it's going to point us back to God. It's going to point us to a place of being on our knees in worship, and that's where fear of the Lord begins. That's where wisdom begins. And, and uh, before we, we stand, I want to pray, and then after I'm done praying, I want you to, to rise, and I want you to sing, and on your way out, please uh, grab a sticker, put it on your water bottle uh, or your computer. Don't put it on a red Subaru Outback sitting out in the parking lot. Um, <laughs> that was so bad, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Father God, thank you so much. I ask that you would give us wisdom. Help us, Lord, before we do anything, before we think a thought, before we put our sticker somewhere, before we do anything, we would say, is this the wise thing to do? That we would humbly bow before you in worship. And that's what we long to do now. So we stand and we give you the honor and the glory due your name. In Jesus Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Please stand.